I'm so excited to see you on screen. <laughs> I feel like I should turn off my camera. Everybody else has turned off their camera. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to a special edition of the Author Book Talks. And our guest speaker today is a curator, an architectural historian, and our alumnus, Dr. Mohammed El Shakir. After graduating with, from NJIT with Bachelor in Architecture, Mohammed earned his master's from MIT. Agahan Program for Islamic Architecture and a PhD from New York University's Department of Middle Eastern Studies. He has been a postdoctoral fellow in art histories and aesthetic practices at the Berlin based Forum Transregional Studien. And his career spans architecture, design, and material culture. He curated the British Museum's Modern Egypt project in 2017. And Egypt's winning pavilion, Modernist Indignation at 2016 2018 London Design Biennale. And this exhibit has been awarded the Biennale's Medal for the most outstanding overall contribution. He also curated the forthcoming Cairo Modern at the Center for Architecture. In 2018, Apollo Magazine named Mohammed among the top. 40 under 40 influential thinkers and artists in the Middle East. To stimulate public debates around issues of architecture, heritage, and urbanism in the region, in 2011, he founded an online platform, CairoObserver.com, with printed issues of the magazine by the same name distributed in events in Cairo, Beirut, and Dubai. Dr. El Shaket's scholarship is focused on modernism in Egypt and Arab world. His dissertation and other work discuss the development of architecture in Egypt with emphasis on the built environment in Fair Island. The history of modern architecture, as we know, has been traditionally focused on Europe and the United States. And Dr. Shaket's work, and especially his most recent book, Cairo Since 1900, an architectural event published by American University in Cairo Press in January 2020, fills the existing gap. It also places the Egyptian modernism in the international context. The number of English language publication about Cairo architecture is limited, and they mostly focus on the ancient world monuments and Islamic heritage. Cairo since 1900 is the first comprehensive survey of the Egyptian capital's modern architecture. Arranged by geographical area, the guide includes entries for more than 220 buildings and sites. Each entry consists of concise explanatory text describing the building and their significance. It covers everything from apartment building, law courts, mosques, churches, synagogues, museum, private villas, and so on. It also, and I believe it, uh, because this is critical, includes no longer existing demolished buildings, which raises legitimate questions of the conservation and preservation of the historical heritage. It is richly illustrated, including more than 300 photographs, drawings, and maps. And published only a year ago, this book can be now found in numerous libraries worldwide, including the United States, Egypt, Spain, Germany, France, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Sweden, Lebanon, and United Arab Emirates. And now I'm happy to welcome Dr. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. I'd like to start by thanking Maya for her patience in organizing this event. Uh, it's been long coming. And uh, I also have to say a special thanks to my teachers at NJIT, Gabrielle Esperdi, who really opened my eyes to the world of architectural history, um, and as well as um, Dr. Zainab Chalik. Um, at AUC Press, I have to thank uh, my editor, Nadia Nakrib, uh, who I'm not sure if she was able to join us today. Um, and what I'll try to do today is uh, sort of put the book in context. Uh, this, is, this is my first book. Uh, since then, I've published also the um, Arabic translation of my doctoral dissertation at NYU, which was titled uh, Revolutionary Modernism, Architecture and the Politics of Change in Egypt. 
um, it was talking about the sort of the revolutionary moment that was co-opted uh, in the 50s, uh, but it was also written in 2011 in the midst of another, uh, uh, let's say, co-opted or not, you know, or another revolutionary moment that didn't grow so well. So there's a kind of a contemporary relevance um, to, to the book, so I'm very pleased that it was published in Arabic in, in Cairo by the National Center for Translation. What I'll try to do today is, uh, like I said, give some context to the book, and then I like to show a lot of images. I won't speak too much about specific buildings, but what I'll try to do is to give you a taste of the variety uh, of the architecture that's represented in this um, guidebook. Um, just before I begin, I should point you to the book's website, uh, CairoSense1900.com. Um, I have sort of uh, a plan to add a blog uh, element to it and invite others um, to reflect and write uh, short pieces um, about um, um, about modern architecture in Egypt. Um, just one more sort of thing. Uh, my my publisher has been very generous to also um, um, create a sort of a discount code. If you're ordering the book from North America, you can order directly from the publisher if you want to bypass Amazon and, and the giants uh, and you don't find it in your local bookshop. So you can use this uh, website and this uh, discount code uh, throughout the month of March. So with the formalities out of the way, um, this is a, a, a common site uh, in, across Egyptian cities today. Uh, and often these sort of holes in the urban landscape uh, were once occupied by um, architecture that we can sort of, for the lack of other terms, call modern or modernist uh, that was developed throughout the beginning of the 20th century. Um, some, while some of these buildings are not necessarily iconic, others are really quite important in the sort of global history of modernism, such as this example in Alexandria, another city that was quite rich uh, with modernist architecture, which has lost almost in the entire uh, heritage of modernism uh, in the face of um, real estate development uh, that's looking to capitalize on the very limited uh, land. So villas, for example, which were quite common as a typology uh, in a city like Alexandria or in Cairo would be demolished and replaced by uh, quite large uh, apartment blocks that lack any architectural character. You can see almost in the background what some of that architecture looks like. So there's been a kind of uh, quite active erasure of this heritage. And like I said, uh, while many of these buildings were not really built to be iconic in the sense uh, that we're sort of used to when we're looking at architectural history, uh, some of them are. Uh, this is a really, uh, you know, one of the early uh, examples by uh, Ardos Perret, who went on to, to sort of have uh, quite a thriving career in, in France and especially sort of the reconstruction in Portugal, France. And some of his ideas are really manifested in this uh, uh, villa in Alexandria, which no longer exists. And so part of the urgency of doing this book was to, um, was to actually engage with a very uh, serious reality where um, architecture is sort of, um, not seen as, uh, as 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 a carrier of meaning and history. It's more seen in a very pragmatic sense, uh, typically in Egypt, in the sense that how much uh, space can we fit uh, on a particular plot? Uh, how many people can live there? And so with the demographic transformation, the economic transformation, with the lack of any preservation policies, what we end up seeing is the erasure of actually a really significant part of Egyptian uh, uh, modern history. And just to show, uh, briefly, uh, what what the law actually uh, says uh, in terms of heritage and preservation, um, it's really quite uh, loose. The, there is no real definitions that protect this heritage, um, unfortunately. Um, and and the process of actually listing is quite complicated. You you need to get a signature from very high echelons of government just to get a local uh, building like a house. Uh, listed. And basically, we need to go to the prime minister. So you can imagine in a country of 100 million, prime minister probably busy with other things uh, rather than listing uh, buildings uh, on the local level. And this is part of the sort of the lack of a democratic uh, system of urban governance. Um, so well, we I, I wrote about this issue uh, last year on platform space, and I would like to just point this out in uh, platform spaces an online uh, platform uh, for architecture. And uh, this came out in, in September uh, and without going into much more detail about the issue of demolition, I, I think I kind of 
laid it out in this particular piece. Um, so feel free to 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 take a look at that. Um, and put in also the issue of heritage in a wider context. Um, so, for example, um, you know, you can think of why architecture can be interested in not just for its qualities, uh, tectonic qualities, but because perhaps the patrons were significant in Egyptian history. So uh, a very obvious example is this villa, which was designed for a very important singer, really for the, uh, the Arab world and I would say the world in general, um, Uncle Thum, who's had a very long thriving career, an amazing journey from you know a peasant girl reciting the Quran in villages with her father to becoming sort of this um, you know, international star shoots, and she commissioned this villa um, in the 1930s, and it was designed by the person who later becomes the very first dean of architecture in the School of Architecture at Cairo University, which was dominated by British professors at the time. And so, actually, there's something really quite interesting, uh, you know, looking at the journey of this person, why choose this kind of architecture to represent her, her sort of. Uh, well, her wealth and status at that point. She didn't try to replicate the kind of uh, aristocratic architecture. Modernism actually fulfilled uh, the need to, to represent oneself for someone like this without being associated with sort of existing uh, designs that might have to do with uh, the arist aristocratic class, which is not part of. Um, and so the house has been demolished. Ali Nabi Prabhupada is the architect. So here we have actually a double significance the patron and the architect, uh, given that he was the first, uh, like I said, um, uh, Egyptian to to um, to be the dean of architecture, um, and so part of the challenges of actually constructing a history of architecture uh, in Egypt, in the absence of the existence of the field, is to try to identify who. Uh, was practicing and what they were doing. Um, these are just some of the names, um, as 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 in many other places around the world. It's a, it's, it was a very male dominated uh, profession, um, and uh, women are sort of present more as patrons, uh, let's say. But I was very happy, for example, to find this image um, in the research in an a Cairo based a French language magazine that was uh, basically kind of. Uh, well, it was it's a, it's a cultural magazine, and I found this image kind of printed quite small, and I said, "Help! Oh, here's here's a, here's a female student," and it's that kind of difficulty of identifying who was doing what, um, but also to 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 engage with the question of gender in terms of the profession. Um, I'll just go quickly through a couple of names just to put them out there so people are familiar with some names. Um, and so Antoine Selim Nahas is one. This is a picture uh, at the steps of the Faculty of Fine Arts. Uh, so there is also kind of an interesting question of how to write the history of architecture from an institutional perspective. There is sort of the technical uh, institutions, which were much more uh, engineering based. Uh, there was Cairo University, which then established the School of Architecture in the 1920s. And then there was a fine art school, which goes back earlier in the 20th century. Uh, and it did combine art and architecture. And then you have professional associations uh, that start to pop up around 1915, 1916, right after World War I. So there's really kind of a multitude of, of avenues to approach the history of the profession. Um, Mahmoud Riyadh is another one uh, who uh, did both urban planning and architecture. Um, was quite uh, active with state projects at some point. Uh, Charla Ayrut is another one. These are actually still existing buildings, um, which I, I should point that out because quite a few of the buildings that we will be looking at uh, are either defaced, deformed, or completely destroyed. Um, this was in my neighborhood just down the street from where I lived in Cairo. I lived in Cairo for the past decade, uh, 2010 to 2020. Um, and this beautiful uh, church was commissioned, for example, by the Catholic Syrian community in Cairo. So there's a lot of social history that these buildings carry. Unfortunately, in today's world, and sort of the war on terror and how it manifests on the local level, I cannot access this church. There's no way I can go inside. Uh, and we're only able to to sort of piece together the pieces uh, that we can find online or through family members or old residents who may have had photos. Uh, so these are some of the challenges that I'll be sort of throughout the talk will be mentioning. So while the building still exists, while it was right down the street from where I lived for several years, I was not able to access it uh, even as a specialist. Uh, Who's, who's trying to construct this history. Uh, another important figure who's kind of my main um, 
you know, there's kind of a challenge here also, which is to, do we have to replicate this sort of art historical model that is much more sort of coming out of the US and Europe in which the architect is presented as some sort of genius and an artist? Uh, do we have to replicate this in a world in which architects fulfilled a much more pragmatic role in the profession. Uh, but one of the sort of the exceptions or one of the figures that I found that sort of has a foot in both worlds, uh, you know, he is providing services and he doesn't necessarily uh, have this, uh, you know, he is aware of the sort of being, uh, the idea of being sort of a, an artist or a genius or, you know, a, a theorist and sort of he presents himself, he even photographs himself in that way. But at the same time, he also provides services to clients um, um, you know, many buildings that were, we would never even have uh, access to the names or locations of those. So there's kind of, he has a foot in both of those worlds, uh, is Saeed Karim. So he's quite important for other reasons, mainly um, because he it, it created and published the first Arabic language design magazine, which um, went on from 1959, 39 to 1959, with 67 issues in total. There were some disruptions in there uh, throughout this uh, time span. It wasn't necessarily consistent, but I would say it's really uh, one of the most uh, significant records of the architecture of that period. However, it's also a very uh, selected uh, record. Uh, it's not comprehensive in any way uh, at all. Um, one of the projects that I did in tandem, which Maya mentioned, which was uh, in tandem with writing the book, was doing this exhibition or display actually um, for the London Design Biennial in 2018. And what, what I wanted to do there is really uh, engage with what it means to have kind of traces of such a rich and important uh, part of uh, history of a place, uh, but yet not be able to construct it uh, fully because of, let's say, political events or, you know, real life events that that really kind of uh, erased a lot much of this history. Um, so the exhibition focused on Sayyid Karim himself and uh, the magazine he established. Um, I should mention one of the examples of why this history is very difficult to construct is that in 1952, uh, during anti-British protests, uh, just months before the coup d'etat that sort of uh, ended the monarchy and supposedly also ended British uh, uh, imperialism, not exactly true, but that's, that was the narrative anyway, there were fires that were set in, in downtown Cairo and the office of Say Karim was actually affected directly by these fires. And the entire archive of the magazine, which had been established now for over a decade, was completely lost. This is one of the printing blocks for one of the uh, images um, uh, in, the, in the magazine that I was able to recover. Uh, and what you see here displayed is the vol is the very is the first the volume of the first year of the magazine. So there was a kind of a, a necessity here to highlight. This has just some behind the scenes images uh, of, of doing the display, but there was a kind of a necessity to to instead of try hard to pretend like we have a complete narrative to actually highlight the difficulties uh, in constructing this narrative. Um, you know, for example, in 1965, 64, 65, Sayyid Karim was put under house arrest. He lived on for 40 more years. Um, and so uh, what does that mean uh, in trying to reconstruct the history of modernism, where one of its main figures uh, not only lost his archive, had his offices confiscated, but is also put under house arrest for 40 years. This is not the typical storyline. Uh, the sort of the heroic storyline that we're always sort of introduced to in the history of, um, of modern architecture and its main architects. Um, you know, we, we tend to get the stories later on uh, about, you know, how troubled Frank Lloyd Wright was or so on, but in the main narrative, you know, he's kind of a hero. And, and, and so there aren't many heroes when we're looking in a context like this. Um, um, and so in part of the display that I did in London was this video that I commissioned, which uh, tried to sort of, the theme of the biennial was emotional, uh, uh, was, was really tackling the issue of emotions. And so what I wanted to do was to not only present this figure, his, uh, his role, but his relation also to the political environment, but also to capture this idea of how is it to be trapped in your own house, which he designed for himself in 1949. Um, and he was forgotten for about a decade, actually, in the house. So the, the film is both a documentation of the house with um, snippets from a text that he published in 1939 titled What is, Architect what is Architecture? And it was read uh, in the film by uh, Shahida Fahmi, who was one of the 
uh, I would say, most significant contemporary uh, architects uh, in Egypt at the moment. But her career was also troubled by uh, the politics of the country, and she quit architecture for quite some time, right around the revolution of 2011. So it was very interesting for me to bring that contemporary voice affected uh, by politics to, to read the text that was uh, written by Say Karim, who's also been affected by the politics of the country at that time. Um, so I'll just show a, 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 like maybe a minute of the video. ستبقى دائما سجيلا يقرأ فيه تاريخ العصر الذي سلم وثقافة ومدنية الشعوب التي تتوارد معه لقد انتهت العمارة من كونها فرعا من فروع الفن um. And so here's here's what the overall display was done, and it was done on a shoestring budget. Um, just just to mention that. So enough of the display. I just thought it was important context for other work that was being done around the <laughs> Yeah, so just a bit of a poetic ending to the idea of being suspended in space in your own in your own design, essentially. Um, he was he was named in the press in the 1950s the flying architect because he was invited really all around the region to consult and to design buildings from Jordan to Saudi Arabia to Kuwait and so on. So there's kind of the irony that the flying architect is trapped in his own house for for over a decade, um, and he never really practiced even after the house arrest was uh, lifted. Um, so. Context for the book. I think this kind of gives you an idea of where this all comes from. Um, one of the some of the main points uh, I, I, I would say that the book is trying to sort of present um, is that Cairo is, is essentially a 20th century city. Um, this is a map from um, 1912, and you can see the pink area is really the entire uh, de developed area. Uh, the smaller pink er area within is the sort of the ancient city. Um, and this is the city at the beginning of the 20th century. Today, that whole uh, pink area is what you see here in the center. So everything else was um, built after 1912. And so that gives you a sense of the scope of, uh, well, how, how um, you know, one way to look at the city is that actually it's a 20th century city. Um, a lot of development happens in the beginning of the century. There is a revolution that takes place in 1919. It awakens a national ethos. There's a search for sort of a very progressive look at the future. There's a lot of publications around the idea of the house. Um, general reading, not, uh, uh, not by architects only, not for architects only, which I find to be a quite of a, an interesting development. Um, and, and, and another point that the book tries to make is that architectural culture in the city has always been porous, uh, partly because of its location. You have to realize that it's at the intersection of both Africa, Asia, and Europe. And so, um, you know, it's important historically to, to place these uh, sort of contexts that we're talking about. And I think one of the interesting things that I should mention here is I chose to not do a national sort of history of architecture because I think that that model has actually failed us in many ways. And instead, the city as a sort of a site um, that is a cacophony of architectural styles that are built one next to the other, perhaps that for me uh, is a more interesting uh, lens to look at, uh, at, at the history of, of architecture. Um, and again, another point is that it was a sort of a rich ecosystem for sophisticated architectural uh, culture to develop. Um, you know, there were conferences. This is a conference in 1945. There are key moments in, in history. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, I'm sort of hungry for uh, when, when looking at architectural history is the political context, because I find it 
really significant uh, as a lens to understand what is happening. So for example, 1919 with the revolution that takes place, it really affects architectural culture in a particular way. You know, World War II affects architectural culture, uh, World War II and World War I actually. Uh, for example, you know, uh, Max Hertz uh, Pasha, who is an Austrian uh, Jewish architecture, uh, architect and, and, and preservationist, he was in charge of the preservation of Islamic architecture, the codification, the documentation. World War II happens, you know, he's seen as an enemy uh, by the British uh, and he's expelled. Egypt was really the only country he knew when he became depressed and died shortly after. That actually has a direct impact on the architectural culture of the place. Same thing happens in World War II. Much of the construction business was run by Italian immigrants. And when Italy enters World War II, uh, the British uh, basically confiscate assets of Italian uh, immigrants and shut down their companies. And that it directly impacts uh, architectural culture. Right after World War II ended, there was a kind of an excitement that uh, the promise was uh, that in 1936, the British will leave uh, Egyptian cities formally, the occupation would formally end, there was a treaty. But however, the, uh, uh, that treaty was postponed uh, uh, because as an, as an excuse that World War II started. Uh, so when the war ended, there was a kind of an excitement that now we can take charge and so conferences were held. And this is an image from uh, the Arab Engineering Conference that was held. Uh, this particular image is from 1947, but the first one was in Alexandria, the second one was in Cairo, for, so 45, 46 in Cairo, um, uh, 47 in Damascus, uh, and then you know 1948 there's a bit of an interruption because of another war. So these political contexts are really important. There was an aspiration for Arab uh, engineering and architectural professionals to come together to sort of build this new future after the war ended. Um, and there were, you know, exhibitions that looked at, you know, focused on materials, um, uh, like concrete. And architects were quite prolific in writing uh, for the general public, which I think is really interesting uh, as well. Um, so you see a lot of sort of this particular art article is about people's problems, the housing, uh, sort of the housing crisis in cities. Um, um, and, and um, you know, again, not published for architects only. However, there was also a rich sort of uh, press by architects for architects, such as this uh, magazine, different than Alamara, but, but one of the co-editors in that magazine, uh, Muhammad Hamed, uh, really fascinating figure. And I think I just should mention that me doing research in that context and realizing the significance of magazines and the absence of any sort of press, uh, architectural press in the moment, while I'm, I'm still a student, really uh, triggered this uh, desire to, to not only blog about architecture online, but also to do uh, sort of a print physical, uh, you know, manifestation of it and invite multiple voices to, to reflect on issues that have to do with architecture, heritage, modernism, and so on. Um, so this is actually where Cairo Observer comes in as a sort of a, a response to realizing the significance of magazines uh, during the period that I'm studying. Um, so let me just check the time. Um, I think I've gone on for 27 minutes, so I, I go for another 10, 15 minutes, if that's okay. Um, so what I'll do now is just, just show you a bit of variety. Um, some of the challenges here is, are, um, you know, do we only focus on monumental sites such as, uh, you know, the Egyptian Museum, the one of the first purpose-built museums outside Europe, uh, I believe. Uh, 1902, it's completed. Uh, it was a ma ma major international uh, architectural competition in, uh, in the late 1890s. Um, and there's a kind of, uh, you know, at the very same moment, you get this building around the same time, these two buildings. Uh, the one on the on the left is um, is a beer uh, brewery, actually, and it's done in sort of an Tuscan style. But what's interesting about it is it's one of the earliest uses of reinforced concrete in the city. This is uh, today a building that is owned by Cairo University and it's uh, falling apart and sort of left and abandoned. Um, on the other hand, you see this kind of very eclectic neo-Islamic palace done, built by one of the princes. He actually designed his own building based on his travels uh, around, uh, around uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Um, at the same time, only one year after the Egyptian Museum, you have this neo-Islamic uh, sort of uh, confection uh, that's uh, done as the uh, Museum of Islamic Art, Arab Art at the time, but now it's Islamic Art. Uh, it was called Arab Art because it included both Coptic and uh, Islamic uh, objects, but then there was a separation 
that happened later on. So now it's the Islamic art and also it's, it houses the National Library. There's two entrances. It's quite a fascinating building. So uh, it's a multifunction building, 1903, in a new Islamic style. Um, and then also roughly around the same time, you get the synagogue, uh, which is the major synagogue in downtown uh, Cairo. Completely different motifs, completely different inspiration, but you also see kind of a, a search for a particular sort of set of signifiers. So this kind of palm, uh, palm, open palm motif uh, that you see in the synagogue here uh, repeats in other uh, um, synagogues around the city uh, throughout the early uh, 20th century. And at the same time, not, not that short, not, not, not that long after, is this new Hindu palace uh, done by, uh, you know, a uh, businessman, a uh, Belgian businessman who settles in Egypt and um, is a, one of the main players in the real estate market. But, you know, so what I'm trying to show you here is within the same decade, you get new Islamic, you get new sort of notions of uh, uh, Jewish architectural language, um, you get, um, the sort of ancient Egyptian uh, mixed with the Beaux Arts in the museum, the, the Egyptian museum, and then you get a Hindu sort of, and this is all happening in one city. I think traditionally, when we look at sort of old fashion, let's say architectural history, one would say uh, that this is all, um, you know, that it's too messy. There's too many things going on. They don't fit into clear categories. There's there's too. Um, these are not easily, uh, I, let's call them, uh, categorizable buildings using the format that emerges from art history in other places. Let's just put it that way. And I think for a very long time, that difficulty in sort of squeezing them into existing nar uh, narratives and existing uh, typologies and stylistic names uh, made these uh, buildings sort of forgotten because they didn't really fit. At the same time, uh, shortly after uh, the 1919 revolution, you get official buildings at a quite a grand scale, such as this courthouse, the Cairo University building, uh, really a, an impressive complex that's built in what used to be agricultural land. This is when we first begin to see large scale development taking uh, place on the west side of the Nile, which was kind of the agricultural hinterland that really fed the city directly. There was a kind of a, a beautiful ecosystem going on that was both Kind of the relationship between the city uh, as an architectural landscape and the agricultural hinterland around it. Um, and this relationship was also governed by a very interesting kind of um, Islamic legal system that tied property together. So one can actually have uh, the rents from a certain property uh, in the city feed into the economy of uh, of agriculture on the other side, the profits from the agriculture actually feeds into the maintenance of the buildings. And this was one of the systems that the British wanted to dismantle because it meant it was a kind of a parallel system to the economy that they can manage. Um, and ironically, the system is actually dismantled under the so-called nationalistic uh, government that came after uh, the coup d'etat of 1952. So I just say this again, because the political context is really important to understanding this kind of uh, historical narrative of architectural development in the city. It's not really enough to talk about these buildings in terms of their appearance, their style, who designed them, and so on. Uh, you know, you get the first Egyptian-owned bank uh, in this, again, kind of eclectic, um, what we can call it if we have to sort of a neo Renaissance Islamic thing, uh, but again, this kind of difficulty of trying to describe the uh, buildings like this using those kind of categories really, we have to kind of either abandon them. Uh, I would say not really invent new categories, and I think what would be really interesting is to actually look at the buildings and describe them for what they are, without a sort of an allegiance to a stylistic uh, or like without commitment to, to to a stylistic lens some architects did very actively try to engage with the question of style such as um mustafa fahmi who was an architect of the palace uh, and so in the post 1919 moment he was looking to create a national architecture so this is kind of an egyptian approach to neoclassicism let's say uh, but this is the exception this is not the norm um you know, and then you get again the rise of a new class of professionals who are building their own houses in that newly developing uh, territory on the west side of of uh, of the Nile, uh, Giza. Um, so quite a lot. It starts with really. It always kind of starts with villas, and then uh, with time, the villas are demolished and they turn into uh, you know three, four, five story buildings, and then with time, those might go and then turn into sort of. And as time progresses, unfortunately, the artificial quality uh, degrades. 
a huge part of it has to do with the political control of the artificial profession in Egypt. Uh, it's not a free profession, like not much else is free actually at the moment, uh, and it has been for 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 well since the fifties. Um, I think any society would struggle to to survive, you know, the kind of pressure that's been politically put on the country. Um, anyway, so here are some more various examples just to show you, show you the kind of heterogeneity. Um, of, of of the constructions that are taking place. I tried to put the years uh, and the architect names for the buildings that we know. Sometimes in a photo like this, which is published in Aremara, the magazine that I mentioned that was established by Zaid If you zoom in, here it is that board that, it's, that says what the building is, you know, who the architect is, because this is shortly after construction. This is clearly a photo taken when the building has just been completed. So in some cases, it's really quite easy to identify uh, the architect and to date the buildings. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's really quite difficult. Um, um, just to mention, because this is sort of the famous Egyptian architect that's entered the scene, um, not for the right reasons, I would say, is Hassan Fathi. Uh, he does have one building uh, in the book, uh, which is this mausoleum that he built for a relative, built for a relative of his, in a sort of, a, again, in a, a new Mamluk style to fit with the architecture of the surrounding necropolis um, and here's another mausoleum done for this time another national hero we already saw one national hero one national hero's mausoleum that sort of ancient egyptian neoclassical uh, design that i showed just moments ago and here's another sort of national hero so there's also kind of um, an architecture that goes along with the notion of creating a national pantheon of heroes uh, and that project itself um, Kind of collapses after some point and so we stop getting these kinds of buildings um, mustafa fahmi who had done that ancient egyptian inspired building also dabbled in the idea of doing a kind of a i'm not really i not sure what to sort of frame this in terms of style but uh it's like, certainly a, a, a neo-islamic style of some sort uh as a national architectural language she was commissioned to do quite a lot of national um, um yeah, like state-run uh, buildings or institutions. Um, on the other side uh, of sort of in terms of scale and scope and grandeur, you get these experimentations in housing. Uh, this was a, a city for workers. Um, and this is these are present day photos. Um, you can obviously kind of with an architect's eye point out what the original was. There are these kind of uh, two-story stone clad buildings for workers. And then this is the current status when people have families have expanded and they've also built so it's kind of this like uh tumor like uh, growth that sort of attached to the buildings uh, but it is actually an important part of the building's life story and i think this is why uh you know my idea here wouldn't be to restore the building to what it was uh, you know but i think it's important to recognize uh to, you know why these transformations have taken place this is say karim's own house finished like i said in 48 49 um, you know, he's the one that's most aware of sort of an international notion of how to present architecture. So I'm sure the placement of the car there is very uh, intentional. Uh, you know, this is his wife and sister looking down the stairs, which had this three story long neon pendant uh, hanging from the center. Uh, you know, you can see the kind of art he was appreciating with that sort of distorted painting. You know, he's he's really a, an important figure uh, in this moment. And this is some of his other work. Um, uh, I think I'm running on too long. We've already seen this church. What I'm going to do now is kind of just like flip through so you get a bit of a taste. Um, I want to get to a couple of buildings that I want to say something about. Uh, so for now, I'll just kind of flip through. Um, Oh, this is an interesting case, actually. So this is the Nile Hilton, which is really quite famous internationally for its place sort of in the Cold War politics again. Uh, and what I find fascinating here is that in my research, I found uh, several things. One was um, an advertisement shortly after the 1952 revolution uh, or coup d'etat. Uh, to build this new modern hotel to represent the new Egypt, and it was to be built on the site of the barracks that had been occupied by the British Army for something like 80 years. Um, and what was interesting is that that particular ad was to look for people to sort of buy into or subscribe or sort of donate 
towards the construction of the project. And the design was schematically published in that advertising. Uh, and it was very clear that it was done by Mahmoud Riyad. When the Hilton company walks into the, the project, uh, Welton Beckett comes with it. And so here we have kind of a situation in which identification of whose design is this really becomes kind of a murky ground, murky waters. Uh, so typically the hotel is credited to Welton Beckett, but in fact, the design pre-existed before he walked into the project. And I think most of Beckett's contributions were the interiors, which were again, kind of done in collaboration with local designers. Um, so it gets a bit kind of interesting in the question of identification, but again, this is a building that, that we cannot read purely in a stylistic terms. It really needs to be read in the political context and its place in the Cold War. A um, few more examples. Um, Say Karim living sort of his Le Corbusier fantasy here. This is one of his housing projects, which I'm currently writing a chapter exclusively on this uh, housing model. It's quite interesting, but I won't get into it now for time. Um, interesting church architecture, Ramsi Suisa Wasif, I think is the more interesting uh, new vernacularist than Hassan Fathi. Uh, but because um, uh, the new vernacular was sort of identified by New York based historians as a sort of a revival of Islamic tradition. I think they must have found it kind of difficult to squeeze in a Coptic designer. But in fact, this is not really, it was never really about, you know, a new Islamic uh, revival. Um, I think uh, Ramsey Suisa Wasif is the one that really deserves, uh, you know, the attention that Hassan Fatih got. Uh, but identity politics really got in the way, I would say. Um, large scale uh, developments, state developments like, um, you know, TV and radio uh, administration, very central to any dictatorship, and all the equipment was American, thankfully. Uh, so it worked really well. Uh, again, the Cairo Tower, very tied to uh, politics, but also um, structural engineering. You have to, you know, I showed just a few slides ago a residential, tall residential building with the woman posing in front of it. This is the same uh, architect. Slash structural engineer, uh, really fascinating building. Uh, it's about to be really ruined because there is a big investment project to do a London Eye type of project, uh, the Cairo Eye, which is you know this is really how creative uh, predatory investment can be. And the Cairo Eye will be placed very close to the Cairo Tower, which is actually going to ruin the whole point of the Cairo Tower, unfortunately. So the book also includes um, you know existing buildings proposed buildings, which I think is interesting to think of a city as sort of a layered place with both imaginaries that had, did not, you know, did not manifest, but also, uh, you know, to see them in relation to what was actually built. Um, oh, yeah, I just wanted to show this example. So this is the city's main cathedral, Coptic Cathedral, uh, quite an important site. Um, you can see it's sort of done in this uh, stripped down, uh, let's call it new, vernacular by concrete, uh, uh, you know, the vaults are kind of familiar from all older uh, Coptic churches and, and, and monasteries and so on. Uh, but this building just had uh, in, in 2018, its 50th anniversary. And, uh, you know, this happened to it to celebrate the 50th anniversary. So clearly, um, you know, there's a question here of, you know, our conventions in terms of preservation, for example. So, you know, this is how the caretakers of the building think it should look today to represent their identity and, and the moment that we live in. But, you know, from a preservationist point of view, this is completely sacrilegious. Um, so I think Cairo does raise some interesting questions regarding these issues that I think we're too comfortable uh, with. Um, you know, embassies are included, really just I'm not really sure what to call those styles still. Uh, but the interesting story here is that this is not the architect's uh, design. Uh, or let's, let me just put it this way. The proposal that was put forth for the Supreme Court building was really quite stripped down and, and uh, more brutalist even uh, in its approach. However, the head of the Supreme Court did not like that design because he wanted something that represents Egypt. And this is what he pushed for. So you get this kind of conflict, again, between power and what can architects actually do in, in a, well, in a dictatorship when the Supreme Court uh, judge is telling you what the building should look like. And so anyway, so we end up with this. There are some interesting recent uh, constructions in the book. Uh, again, kind of a, for the lack of a better word, uh, approach, a new approach to new, new vernacularism. Uh, this is a private house by an architect for himself. 
again, proposed projects that were never built. Uh, maybe thankfully, this is a Zahadi proposal for uh, an expo city. And uh, just a tiny bit of sort of a hint towards what the city uh, uh, is sort of allowing in terms of thinking about, about environmentally conscious design. This is the first um, uh, platinum LEED certified building in North Africa. Not sure if it's actually in, in the whole continent, but I know for sure the first platinum LEED um, certified building in, in North Africa. Um, and, you know, some other sort of interesting experimentations in terms of inside outside space, given the climate, uh, such as the Grote Institute's new building. And finally, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about the role of, of, of predatory investment or, you know, real estate investment in, in shaping the future of architecture in a place like this, you know, there's this project, uh, which is meant to be uh, a kilometer square, uh, the largest building in terms of footprint uh, in the world, um, where most of the, so multifunction, where, you know, you can do your shopping, go to the gym, go see your therapist, do everything in the same building, and you never have to actually engage with the city outside, everything looks inwards into these like, almost panopticon-like holes, uh, kind of the Swiss cheese design, uh, but it, it's really, uh, an interesting project just to think about, you know, where can architecture go uh, in this particular context today? So this is it in terms of giving you a taste of, of the book and what's in it. Uh, I hope I've raised some interesting uh, sort of questions. And just to quickly say that last March, uh, uh, it was set to open this exhibition that Maya mentioned in her introduction at the Center for Architecture in New York. Uh, kind of a classic book exhibition, I would say. Uh, but of course, because of COVID, it was postponed, but it will hopefully open sometime in the near future when we're all vaccinated and healthy. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to engage with any questions you have. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Wonderful presentation. I love the book and its presentation so much. So uh, anybody has any questions, you can either ask them or you can put them in the chat. Do we have any questions? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Mohammed. Hello. I have to say I'm a big fan of all your work um, and thank you for the great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so I want you to tell more about your methods. How did you go about collecting all these images and data and um, did you get any help? Uh, because I know how challenging it is to get all these uh, kind of uh, resources and, and info and information about all these buildings. Yeah. Thank you for uh, the great question. Um, well, working on this was quite challenging, and this is a book project that took about five years. Um, I wasn't focused on it the entire five years. I was doing other work. Uh, well, you know, it's important to note that also we live in a world in which you know, uh, you cannot really live on doing books, so you have to be doing something else. So a book like this took about five years uh, with a team of volunteers that at its biggest uh, was about uh, 20 people. Um, and I should really mention here that I'm very grateful to someone. Her name is Hala Hidiazi, a brilliant architect who's currently based in Berlin, struggling with uh, all kinds of uh, issues that are present in the workplace in a place like Berlin for a woman of color. But uh, I really salute her because she really held this project together and she managed the team. And so what the team was doing was a couple of things. There were some people surveying the city, so I sort of wanted to start from scratch in a way. So not only rely on the published materials, that was important to gather, but we wanted to also survey the city. So that means walking neighborhoods um, and identifying buildings that, you know, from the perspective of the, the young art, in a way, this was a participatory book, I would even say, because a lot of these young architecture students who were walking around, they were bringing to my attention buildings that ended up in the book that I would have never known about. Um, because it's impossible for one person to, to walk around the city besides the Cairo. Uh, and again, this is the first book of its kind. And, and so there's a lot of uh, weight here, uh, a lot of you know, pressure. How do you represent the city in this format? And I should say the format, um, before completely answering your question, the format, architectural guides are really important. Uh, if we really think about what happened in the preservation movement in, the, in, the, in England, for example, it was really the work of 
you know, historians who didn't publish books for other historians only, it was also the work they did to publish architectural guidebooks that reach a, a wider audience. And I think in such an urgent situation when demolitions are happening at a really fast pace, you know, a book that takes five years, during the making of the book, so many buildings that were on our initial list were demolished. Um, so that's that's just to mention some context there. So yeah, so there was surveying, there was identifying all of the published material, whether they're old magazines, uh, some books, there are some interesting books in Arabic that have been published in the 50s, 60s, uh, even in the late 80s, there was an attempt by um, by an architect to do a sort of an architectural survey of, of modernism in, in Egypt. Um, and so those were very useful to identify, to get images. And then there was, of course, new photography, which was completely challenging because either the buildings are in poor shape, they're overgrown with trees, or most likely, as happened in many cases, you will be chased down the street in a security state where there's a paranoia around the presence of cameras. And so, uh, you know, our our team was chased down the street. Uh, you know, I was once with a group of uh, with a group, and we actually got pulled into a police station, and we had to, you know, <laughs> talk our way out of it uh, before we're all being caged. That was the maybe kitchen table that I'm sitting on, you know, it's really challenging. Research in Egypt is not something that's welcomed, and I think it's really important to uh, to say this out loud, um, because I, I feel like if we cover up, not everybody has access to archives, not all contexts have institutions that hold the memory of the profession. Not all professionals in every uh, national setting are able to actually speak freely and to have an opinion. Um, and so those realities actually shape trying to do a book like this. And this is why I try to actually point them out so that we don't end up with a sort of a beautiful looking final product that pretends that Cairo is just as sort of easy to work on as Lisbon or, or definitely Paris or something like this. So yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think that we have another question in the chat. In the new capital in the round, there is surgeons of these complex complexes of living situations where people don't have to live anywhere. This was clear in Skyline. Do you think foreign investment and influence is beneficial toward preserving Egyptian culture? Um, I, I, I think I think what's uh, maybe important is to highlight or to be aware of uh not only the political realities but the role of capital in a place like egypt um because i think a lot of the disappointment that comes with questions like why aren't people invested in preserving these buildings and reusing them it doesn't really fit with the general sort of uh, function of capital in a place like egypt today uh where questions of ownership uh you know inheritance uh, legal structures that are sort of accumulated over the last several decades that have not been sort of updated that sort of make the investment in existing architecture really not profitable. Um, and so the laws uh, that govern both real estate, but also the economy that governs, I would say, the country in general, are not really geared towards that approach. And so you end up with these kinds of developments. I would say the influence of capital has been horrendous in Egypt. <laughs> Let me just summarize it and say that. So I'm not I'm not seeing uh, interesting uh, architectural developments in today's economy. There is a lot of money being poured into construction. Egypt is probably one of the most active places in terms of construction. I mean, China is with the size of China. I think of the amount of construction there with the size. Egypt competes with China in terms of cement use and construction. That's ridiculous. Uh, and so there's kind of a, a forever ongoing kind of a developmentalist uh, approach that's not really looking to solve uh, or provide solve problems, urban problems, or provide, uh, let's say, shelter or housing that's of quality, but it's more uh, the only channel for people to invest their money in such a controlled economy. So instead of keeping your money in the bank, you keep buying this kind of real estate and you hope that uh, its value will go up. So the design is not really central here. This is not really about architecture, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Um, hi, um, I'm George. Um, I used to live in Cairo for a really long time. Um, I've been born there and I had a, I love architecture since I was very young. And um, I just have to thank you for this book and how amazing it is to find a guide. Um, I'm from Maddie, by the way, and there's a lot of stuff I've never known until I just read that book. And I just have to thank you because I think it's, it's an important thing to have like we I, i've never seen a guide book like this before i'm talking about a lot of stuff in egypt um in cairo specifically and um and i found it very interesting and i found it's a it's a very it's a hope it's a point of hope that maybe the next generations would continue on with that book and i know how hard it is to have a research in egypt especially in egypt um so i just have to uh, to, to accommodate you about that Thank you so much for having that book, and um, you just don't know that that's going to be so useful, so 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 useful. I'm very grateful for this. Thank you so much, George. I mean, this is why I guess this is. Um, I just want to say that it's it's really important to also point out. I'm an I'm an independent uh, researcher, uh, curator, whatever the the hat that I need to put on on a certain depends on the context what the project is. And, uh, you know, maintaining independence uh, does come with a lot of uh, cost uh, to one's career and life. But I do think that um, I'm grateful that I was able to do something like this uh, because it's really kind of a, 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 a product of love, let's just say. Um, you know, this is, I'm not doing, I didn't do this to get a position or to, <laughs> to get that kind of recognition. So I'm really, you know, your response is exactly why I'm, 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 I'm sort of, I wake up in the morning to do these kinds of projects. So thank you so much. No, 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 not at all. Because I, to be honest, in, in my opinion, like um, Cairo, Egypt specifically, has a lot of architectural influence throughout the history. And uh, maybe they are from, because, you know, it, it got invaded from a very, from very different culture throughout the time. And there's a lot of stuff there that um, the world doesn't know about because basically no one talks about it. So yeah. I found that book is is very is doing that job. It's starting to do yeah. that job. Thank you so much. Thank you. But actually, you just reminded me of a little note that I would like to mention, just because it's something I learned about uh, very recently. So um, you know, there is cities are branded. Uh, cities create images for themselves. Sometimes they actually create a brand. You know, the NYC love NYC sort of T-shirt that everybody wears that's on every mug. You know, this is a an active effort to brand the city in a certain way. Some you know, I'm in Mexico City. There is a very clear branding project which you know CDMX uh, that sort of brand. Uh, Cairo doesn't really have this, but to understand this, one really needs to look at you know, public relations, you know, the invention of public relations. And Cairo is not at the moment looking to, um, to, to, to capitalize on the kind of history that we're talking about in this book. Um, it, it sort of fills another uh, space um, in sort of the political and economic structure. So the branding of a place doesn't just have, it's not just about why is some city branded in a way, in a certain way, and others are not. Uh, you know, these are very particular projects that come from uh, public relations idea that uh, someone by the name of Edward Barnes invented, uh, really not that long ago, that has been really governing the, our understanding of places. So, you know, what's really interesting is that I get a lot of sort of surprise responses to the book, as if I am uh, single-handedly branding, uh, trying to brand Cairo uh, with Cairo Observer and the and, and this guidebook in a particular way. And this is not what this is about, uh, but it's important to actually understand where this fits in that kind of, uh, in the, yeah, in that kind of question of branding a place in a city in a certain way. It's really interesting. I think at our time is up. I want to thank yes. Mohammed. Thank you very much for coming today, and I hope that you will come back with your new book. I'm looking forward to the second, your second book. Uh, for thank you. So much. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Maya and everyone. It's really been a great pleasure. Um, to be part of this conversation. And then, uh, like I said, um, if you haven't gotten your hands on the book, it's at the library at NGIT, and you can also order it from AUC's website or from whatever else, wherever other uh, sites you use to get your book. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. That was great. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye.